I have a few copies left of the chapter nine notes. These are the ones we've been using all week. Okay. Anyone else? All right. So I've uh, posted the assignment on Moodle. Uh, it's uh, due on Tuesday after reading week, uh, so right around midnight. Sorry. And yeah, it's based on your mixture of Gaussian's lab. So if you did that lab, you're uh, you're halfway or even more than halfway there. Uh, the thing I the thing I always uh, flag and maybe not every year, but uh, certainly every other year, almost every year, it feels like um, we catch someone cheating. And that person usually leaves the program. So they paid their money, a lot of money in most cases, to, to be here. Um, and then they get nothing out of it because they cheated on a, on a homework. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Right. If you can't do the homework, um, you, should, you should let me know so that we can help you so you can figure out what's missing. Uh, so you can ask more questions, but don't cheat on homework. It's not worth it. Just doesn't doesn't make economic sense uh, or any other kind of sense besides being incredibly dishonest. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot of work for me to to go through the paperwork of chasing someone who has cheated. Uh, but I have. I always do it. Even though I'm very busy, so <laughs> don't think that I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just too busy. I can't bother. Every time I do it, so that I can stand here and say, uh, you, you will get caught. And it's amazing um, how uh, the different ways that people try to cheat, but the different ways we we try to catch people cheating. So just don't do it. Um, right. Today. It's going to be very exciting. I hope uh, things will fall into place now. Things that we've been seeing all week and partly also from, from regression. Um, we're going to see them uh, coming together so that we can accomplish some really cool computer vision applications. Um, we still have to go through a few, a few important topics that are still pretty heavily mathematical. Because, well, in, in practice, when you have larger amounts of data, um, all the things we're, we've been doing, you continue to do. But people have tried to find shortcuts. Uh, and so we'll, we're going to start with incremental fitting and boosting. Um, so just jump into it, really. We've been saying that uh, we can have an activation for our classification task. Our activation will be based on some weights phi there at the top and uh, x or phi and uh, z, right? If we've got some kind of nonlinear function of x. If, I, if we do this or whether we write it out like this with the phi zero out front and leave the other phi's in, in there inside of the, the sum, it doesn't matter, right? The, it's equivalent. The thing that, that we're doing here, though, is we're going to, just for slight convenience, not, not to confuse you, right? we're going to use this same phi, but now we're going to multiply it by this other function of x. And all we've done here is we've wrapped up inside of this, this Greek symbol psi. Right? This is the psi symbol. So it's just a fancy way of saying, oh, right, when I'm running a function of x, let's just put all the parameters for that function in psi. So whether it's an arctan function or a radial basis function, psi contains those parameters. Right? Normally we say theta contain is this big vector of all the parameters for what we're doing. Uh, but we're, we're trying to isolate this group of parameters and say these are the parameters for our function f. That function f. But the activation. You know, it's still about the weights phi applied to 
apply to different versions of our data X, where you know, the different versions can be arctan versions or radial basis versions. No, no shocks here, right? So far, so good? Yes? All right. So previously, we've been saying, ah, I've got all these parameters. I'd like to optimize them simultaneously. And we would do so uh, with some kind of uh, incremental search, right? So we we're using gradient descent in the lab, or we were also using Newton's method if we can calculate the, the first and second derivative. And we're going to continue to using those techniques wherever we can. Um, but one of the tricky things you should have seen with the, um, what was the function called? The one with the, the funny bowl that curves around? Rosenbock. The? Rosenbock. Rosenbock, yeah. yeah. This, this, uh, I forget the name. Th this function uh, was allowing us to search for our parameters, but we were, we were sort of slightly confounded by the fact that we had to search multiple dimensions at the same time. Okay. Um, we're still going to search in multiple dimensions at the same time, but the, the goal of incremental fitting is to say, oh, if you have k being very large, like 10 or 20 or, or, or even much greater than that, do you have to search in a 10 or 20 dimensional space? Or could you instead be kind of greedy? Greedy is going to be less optimal overall, but Nonetheless, th there are times when incremental fitting gives you a pretty good answer. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, right, this is my activation, right? From the last slide, we saw this. Phi 0 plus phi 1 times some function of our data x with some parameters psi. Let's estimate what is the phi 0, the phi 1, and the parameters psi 1 that, when we use this activation function, give us the max likelihood at training time. Okay, we've already done this before. Uh, we, could, we could do it again. If I told you what the function f was, right? you have choices, as we said. But if I tell you which function f we're using today, you could figure out how to compute the first derivative, the second derivative, and do Newton's method, and optimize those, those three parameters. OK, but we're not done. Because all we've done is we've said there's going to be a phi 0 and a phi 1, and we've optimized those. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go to stage 2, and we're going to say, now I'm going to make the activation more complicated. It's still going to have phi 0. Maybe I can do this here. It's still going to have phi 0. It's still going to have phi 1 times a function of the, the data with that, those parameters. But now it's going to add phi 2 times f of the data with a different set of parameters, psi 2. So it's still the same function. You can think of it as being arctangent. We have you know sort of different arctangent versions. Right, one's maybe here, and the other one's sort of here. So those, that's the difference between psi 1 and psi 2. But what we're going to do when optimizing at stage 2 is we're going to optimize phi 0. We did that before. And we're going to skip optimizing phi 1. We're just going to leave it the way it was after the last, after the last stage. So it just gets left behind, as is, well, as a constant, and not, not worrying about the, the, the other parameters, that means we're still just doing a, a three-dimensional search here, right? And we do optimize phi 2 because we've just introduced it. It's brand new. We don't know what to do with it. OK, we just continue like this. Stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. Each time, we just add on. Well, I think I had a slide here. Right. OK, so all we, we're, we still we optimize the new thing, and we also go back and optimize the phi 0. So we keep updating phi 0 as we go. So at stage k, we're optimizing phi 0 still. And the two parameters, phi k and psi k, that go with the newest thing that we added on, the newest part of the activation function. Do you see why this is suboptimal? I don't see why it worked. You don't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this thing converges to well, nice converges. It, it converges is a strong. You're you're asking a, a a harsher question. You don't works works yes converges no right. Uh, it does 
you, you'll see that it works. Yep, you'll see that it works in just a second. Um, but it's not like it needs to, it's not like it's going to diverge. We asked, basically we, we started off, we, we kind of played this game and said, you get to ask one question, all right? Your one question is going to be one arctangent function. If you only get to ask one question, what would you ask? What would be the shape of your arctangent function? Okay. Now, stage two, we say, all right, all right, all right. You got to ask your one question. What if I give you a second question? You can ask one more question, all right? And, and where would you put your arctangent now? And what happens is that as we go, as k increases, right, as we go through more stages, the, the questions that you would ask, you're going to only worry about things that weren't classified correctly so far. Yeah? So the, the k stage is probably only impacting a small fraction of the training examples that the first K, the, the, the stage one took care of. And that's the secret to the universe. <laughs> okay, so here's an example of it at work. You start off before, before you have any radial basis functions, you ask no questions, you say basically in a 2D space, X1 across the bottom, X2 across the, the, the vertical, Equal probability everywhere of both of both classes, right? This is still the male versus female thing, right? With with uh, green being examples of male and uh, sort of the pink being examples of female. All right. We add one radial basis function. We optimize just those three parameters: phi zero, phi one, and psi one. And we say basic. Oh, sorry. We're using not arc tangent, but radial, radial basis. basis, right? So we just have the radial basis function. Okay. So. We basically are saying, let's put down one Gaussian somewhere, decide what the weight of that Gaussian should be, where would you put it, and that's where it decides to put it. Because it said, given the only question I get to ask, I'd like to try to classify as many of the data points correctly as possible. Um, so maybe the thing that we could sort of add to this graph is the training error after uh, for, for each of these images, right? And so you should be looking at this and saying, well, good job, you've, you've classified uh, these pink ones correctly as being W equals 1. Um, you classify these green ones and all of these green ones because they're sort of on the, on the cooler side of the, of the probability distribution. You could say, well, these are probably going to be W equals 0 if we put a decision boundary at this green line. Um, but you're still not doing so great here, right? Because of this, this location of our, first, of, of our first radial basis function, um, these pink points are being misclassified. So, no surprise, if I get to ask a second question, I put down a second radial basis function, leave the parameters of the first one as they were, just optimize the second one, and that initial phi zero, that initial offset. Oh, sorry. Then, you see it goes after this area and says, well, those were sort of, those were affecting my training error the most. Those were was misclassifying a lot of points because of that. And now that's sort of fixed. And it continues. It adds another one here, adds another one here, and then eventually you have 10 radial basis functions. Uh, this is what it looks like, and you can kind of see the, these uh, contours are indicating our, our decision boundaries. Could you have done this with 10 radial basis functions and not doing it incrementally? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. of course. No reason why not. You can differentiate your function f, and with radial basis functions we know we can. You just have to do nonlinear optimization, the kind you, you were doing in the lab. So it's okay. It, it, it does potentially mean it'll run for a longer time. It just has to do a, a greater search. And if the space is, if the energy function isn't convex, then you might converge to a local minimum, and then that would that would be a shame. Um, this is very much a local minimum, but it works. Right? It's, it's greedy, uh, but it, it can work. What's the danger of doing this too much? If I keep increasing this? Yes? Uh, overfitting, probably. I was just wanted to ask, isn't the E, I mean, you could argue that the E is even better than the F. Um. It's true. Uh, so this is why we're not saying anything converged, right? Nothing converged, really. All we can say is, um, that for our greedy algorithm, running it 
for a while. Um, we will get to a point potentially where the training error is zero, i.e., you've asked 10 questions. Uh, I don't know if the training error is zero here, but let's say it is. Let's say there are no misclassified points at, at present. And I say, okay, what's your 11th question? You might say, okay, I'm done. I really have nothing. There's no misclassified point, so there's no place for me to put another radial basis function that would suddenly uh, split the split the data any bit be any better than it already has. So let's say that that would be the maximum you could run to, and potentially you have an overfit now. Uh, the only way to know that would be to have some kind of cross validation where you would say, yeah, um, at this point, let's say where there is currently no data, was I better off? with four radial basis functions, or am I better off with, with 10? Okay, so there's a possibility that if you had, uh, if you had enough data, you could do cross validation, try it a few different times, and take the average. Or there are other ways of saying, oh, I've got uh, multiple classifiers, maybe ones that I intentionally ran greedily up to an abbreviated point, so I stopped early before they overfit, where I, I hope they haven't overfit yet, and then I take take sort of an average of them. We'll see that in, in, a, in a few slides, actually. So do you get the same result doing the incremental pitting as you do by doing it all at once? No. Right. Uh, <coughs> well, it's possible that you could, but it would be a complete fluke. Yes. Which one's better? Um, and if you're doing this, uh, just this simple nonlinear um, optimization, then basically you would have like this exponential number of possible combinations, or like, I mean, this is basically faster. That's the advantage. It, it is. It is faster. Yeah. Um, that's right. I didn't quite understand the first part of the question. I guess. So this is faster because you only are fitting one. RBF at a time. So if you were doing uh, nonlinear optimization as you introduced it a few uh, lectures ago, over all the parameters at once, then essentially, uh, well, that's slower because you have to do all the possible combinations. Yeah, you're considering where you're considering where you are at present, your sort of initial scenario, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to update everybody all at once. In other words, I'm going to potentially well, let's. It sort of points to, to that one where there are two radial basis functions because I have two hands, right? Uh, we would be saying, mm, from this initial setup, right, how can I move both of them? I'm allowed to move both of them in 2D, right? Uh, so that I get the, the optimal separation of the data points so that I maximally sort of classify the, the females as females and the males as males. And instead, we're saying, no, 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 uh, just, just the bottom one. Just move the bottom one around, subject to what we've already established in the previous stages. OK. So the derivative, we've seen this, we've seen this earlier this week, right? The derivative is saying, you know, you've got this activation. You've got the logistic sigmoid applied to that activation. How different is that to the actual label? If you're, if you're not different, no penalty, the questions you've asked in the earlier stages are probably fine. If there's a, a big difference here, right, then that's a problem in the, in the gradient when you're doing these optimizations for the newest radial basis function or the, the newest activation. That's, uh, that's going to cost you more and, you're, and more attention will go there, right? That, that will, those data points will sort of attract uh, attention and we'll, we'll put our, our new activation uh, term there. So the difficult examples might not get sort of handled until you get into these further stages. You can, as we said, truncate this early. You could stop here or you could stop here, but you, you should be conscious then that maybe you've only classified sort of the obviously separable data points and some of the trickier ones closer to the complicated decision boundaries, right, where there's, you know, this island here, that those only come in, uh, would, have been, would have been captured later, in later stages. Okay. Oh, sorry. 
Sorry, just to yeah. go back to the um, the kind of incremental fitting. Yeah. Um, if you do the incremental fitting, it's kind of faster to get a fit. Yes. Than doing it by nonlinear kind of optimization. You're still. We agree that you're still doing a nonlinear optimization either way. But on instead of doing it on all the variables. But on a small subset of the variables. So. It, it's faster to get a fit, mm -hmm. but if you did it on all the variables at once, is it true to say that you'd possibly be able to get a similar level of classification, but with a fewer number of variables? Uh, because it, the it's, it's depends, very dependent on your data, right? We could lay out your data where I think that could be true. We could lay out the data in a way where that would be harder, right? So we could we could make data I, I, how would I do this? I'd probably put a bunch of data examples where maybe um, maybe we've got some pluses and minuses for the two classes, right, rather than two different colors. Um, if, I, if I put some pluses and minuses like that, you would say, okay, that's pretty easy. Now maybe I'll, I'll mix in a few minuses, you know, I'll just do that. So if you ask one, you know, the first one will will converge very quickly. Second one would try to split sort of horizontally. Um, you would probably get um, a better result with the greedy one than with the, um, well, the joint one. No, I guess I'm speculating. I would be I'd be setting up situations like this and, and running simulations to basically see at which point could I get an equivalent result. And and I wouldn't say necessarily that the um, that the full optimization with all of the variables at once would necessarily get away with fewer parameters. So doing a full with four terms. Do I, is this your question? A full optimization with four terms, could that be as good as a greedy one with six terms? Yeah, essentially what I'm asking is, if the greedy is so good and it's faster to run, why would we ever do the full one? Uh, is, is the full one good for some things that the greedy is not? The greedy one can get into local minima. It right. can, oh, it can, for the same <coughs> number of variables, it can more easily overfit because it's greedy, because it, it just goes uh, right away, it will, it will make these sort of, um, I call them divisions, but it's really this sort of, you know, soft, soft division, sigmoid division. Okay, thank you. It, it is, um, I think the, the question is, is absolutely fair, but I guess I, it's hard to give an answer a satisfying answer in that when you're facing problems in the future, you will have to ask yourself, do I want to do the greedy version or the full optimization? And uh, I think what you'll probably do is you'll try the full one first and see if you sort of have the memory and the patience for it to converge. And if it does, you'll stop because you know that's pretty good. And if you don't, you run out of memory, things like that, then you'll say, wait, how do I deal with this? Ah, oh, right, I've got these incremental methods. But this is, this is not, there, there is not what I've always wished for, which is the, the, um, the sort of uh, frequently asked questions for which model should I be using? And that's why when you read computer vision papers, frequently in the abstract already, but, but certainly very, very early on, they say, and we're using this model. Okay, just accept that we're using this model. And maybe at the end of the results they say, oh yes, we compared to trying a few other models. Uh, let's, let's, let's press on and, and, and get to those. Um, boosting is a special case of incremental fitting where we have the activation, we have phi's just as we did before, phi zero that we're always updating. Uh, and phi k that we're you know, the new, always updating the newest one. But our function, instead of being arctan, is the heavy side function. Heavy side function, if you recall, was not that, but 
the one that was zero for a while. So this is our y-axis. That's zero. That's one. And on the x-axis, that's zero. So when the input to the Heaviside function is zero or less, it's an output of zero. If it's greater than zero, then the output is, is one. Not differentiable. OK, so that's slightly, slightly inconvenient. But uh, the Heaviside function is very useful. We, we end up having these uh, sort of steps instead of our, our tangents. And we're going to, to they refer to in boosting um, as weak classifiers. So it's the same, it's the same mentality that I, I was describing earlier. You have a problem. Initially, you have equal probability everywhere of being class 1. And you get to ask one question, except instead of having this nice, soft uh, sigmoid shape, right? you're going to have just a step. And you're going to say, OK, everything on one side of the boundary is one class. Everything on the other side is another class. Otherwise, exactly the same as our regular incremental learning, except that because we can't differentiate. Well, let me, let me get there first. First, so it's just the same. You introduce one step function. Uh, you get an OK training error, but we could do better. So you get to ask a second question. You leave the first one in place. You just adjust the parameters of the second one. So now we're making this horizontal split. Three step functions, four step functions, ten step functions. All right. Now, you would be right to argue, uh, I know these are nice and easy, these step functions, but now there's no sort of gradual fall off. There's no smoothness. It may be that this solution generalizes less well to unseen data points. Uh, because there's no sort of gradual fall off, and I think that's I think that's a fair a fair accusation. Um, it might be that your problem is does have really nice rigid sort of boundaries, right? Really, if it's if it's uh, if it's if it's pink, then it's a raspberry, and if it's uh, black, then it's a blackberry, right? Okay, so really, they're, they're sort of those colors are are definitely informative. But we have this added difficulty that we can't differentiate. And so we have to do something else instead of our normal Newton search for the parameters of each new step function. It's not, it's not fantastically clever. It's not very mathematical. Uh, and it goes like this. We just say, all right, I'm going to make not an exhaustive, but a very, very long list of possible splits, of possible locations of my heavy side function. So if the parameter parameters for this are um, this alpha vector, then we'll just make a whole long list of alphas, which basically corresponds to splitting this space here, 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 here. In, in various ways. We just make a massive list, and then whenever we're updating one of our one of our phi's, so we're, we're at stage k, maybe stage, uh, going from stage 3 to stage 4, we just go through the list, try all the different versions of what alpha is doing, and we pick the one that, that splits this the best. You see people kind of squinting, going, well, that's weird, that's, how is that how is that useful? Well, if you have a pretty long list of ways of, of splitting up your data, then it is almost like, I mean, you are doing a, a search in 2D for where your, where your next split should go. So uh, you don't have to be excited by it. It's not very elegant mathematically, um, but it does work. And it's fairly quick to compute because you can just check all of your training data to see where it lands on, on the side, on which side of each of the decision boundaries, of the individual decision boundaries. So the individual terms that we're adding with each new step are frequently referred to as weak classifiers. 
And because we're, we're taking the sum of all of them, the overall classifier is called the strong classifier. Right? Um, so no stronger than the one optimized on all degrees of freedom at once, but it's made of a bunch of weak ones. Was there a question? Yes. Um, yes, so this is not like essentially like a logical end, but it's more like a more <coughs> um, of these half, half planes the point is in, the more it kind of belongs into. That's correct. OK, so I think that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, so this, this boosting, uh, this is your normal sort of bare bones incremental boosting called logic boost. And compared to what we're, we're going to see in a few slides, it's valuable to point out exactly what you said, which is that it's not that while each individual weak classifier could be viewed as saying, oh, uh, what's the new one? This one is the new one here, right? This new boundary. Uh, you could view it as saying, oh, I, I'd like to split the, the, the w equals 1 from the w equals 0. But it's only adding one additive term on top of all the other terms that already existed previous to it for, for the previous case. In other words, it's, it's only going to try to, to add a little bit of weight for this space compared to what that weight was before. So uh, uh, a new data point with, let's say, x1 and x2 being some combination like right here is affected by all of, the, all of the terms we've had so far. And each one of them gets added together in total. And we see what is the activation for this point. Yeah? That won't always be the case. So. Branching logistic regression is, is exactly that. In branching logistic regression, the equation, uh, if it helps, we still got an activation. It's still, OK, we'll get to summing up multiple terms. But just for now, just notice that there's a, a, a phi 0 x1, uh, sorry, phi 0 xi, and a phi 1 xi. So we just sum of two terms, OK? The thing that's sitting out in front, this is a 1 minus this g function, and this is just the g function. So it's the g and its complement, where the g is a gating function. It returns a number between 0 and 1, and it's basically going to wait. It's going to say, oh, hold on. For this data point, I'm actually going to give a little bit more weight to phi 1 if g is if the g function returns a big number, right? I'm going to give more for that for that particular data point. I'm going to give more weight to phi one. I'm going to trust what phi one does to that data point more than what phi zero does to that data point. The gating function is taking the data point and some new parameters uh, omega. So let's let's look at this in action, right? We've got a bunch of data points living in x1, x2 space, right? It's just their data. Uh, obviously, the color, again, is, is uh, representing the world space. Here you have phi 0. Here you have phi 1. Now, look, at, look carefully at phi 0, the colors, right? You should see a gradient going from bright here, so from w more likely to be 1, to w more likely to be 0 up here. So I would contend that using this version of the weights phi 0, we're doing a reasonable job at classifying the points on the right side correctly, and maybe not so great a job on the left. So these, these ones on the right, uh, these pinks are, are sort of in the warmer colors, and the greens are in the darker colors, and that's good. Whereas on the left, you've got pinks in the dark, that's no good. Phi 1 is just the opposite. You see a gradient going from the lower left to the upper right. right? See this? And you, could, you should see that, yeah, if I had to split the, uh, the probability space at about 0.5, so halfway between dark and bright, it would probably be doing a nice job of separating the data that's here on the left side of the screen. All right? 
So here comes our gating function. Okay? <laughs> we've, we've said we're going to do this incrementally so we can optimize fewer parameters. But maybe we'll add just one little parameter, this omega, so that our gating function can, can kind of choose where, where it's going to operate. And so here the gating function is saying, uh, yeah, for different combinations of x and x1 and x2, I'm going to return a uh, I'm going to return a high value. The gating function is going to return a high value for phi zero. Uh, no, that's right. Okay, it's correct. So it's going to return a low number. So one minus a low number is a big number. So we end up multiplying the points that are on the right side get a lot of influence from phi zero. The points on the left side get a lot of influence from phi one. Yes? The gating function, how do you choose that? You just look like you just draw the line down the middle of the data. Is that basically up to you? you just like it's going to be one of the parameters we search for. Our search for the alpha parameters with heavy side, when you were using the heavy side, wasn't very elegant, right? How do you choose the phi and what are those two functions? Yeah, we now have this problem again, optimizing multiple parameters at the same time where they depend on each other. I, I, I agree this is, this is, uh, this is going to be a tricky optimization if we, if we try to do it, um, if we try to use Newton's method for it. But for, for now, look, can we just agree that there is this, this little sub-problem. We said, let's do this greedily, so we reduce the number of variables we have to worry about uh, instead of having, if we're going to do 10, right, we're going to have 10 phi's. Instead of doing 10 phi's and optimizing all 10 at the same time, we're only going to worry about optimizing uh, one phi at a time. Okay, okay, one phi and one set of parameters for the gating function. Right? So we're optimizing two things at the same time. We're still not optimizing 10, so you should be thrilled, right? You should be saying, oh good, this is better, this is easier. Um, but we're going to optimize these two together, this gating function. So when we apply our gating function, this is telling us basically where should phi 1 be operating, where should phi 0 be operating. The overall activation is this, and when you send that activation into your logistic uh, sigmoid, right, you, you end up with this posterior probability, right, with this decision boundary. Yes, I know we had a somewhat similar ability to separate the data with our nonlinear classification. Um, but note here that we did this in this incremental way. Right? This is this the branching logistic regressor is doing this incrementally. It's only worried about the gating function and the newest phi that we've we've added. Right. And now this is a prelude to why we're doing this. Because at, at right now all you're seeing is Really? I've, I've got more variables than I had just a moment ago. This isn't very exciting. Okay, so consider that when you have split, I'm going to use the word split here, you said I've got a problem and I'm going to make a gating function. I'm going to figure out how to split the data, which parts of the data would prefer to be um, get more weight from phi 0 and which ones prefer to get more weight from phi 1. Now, the weight is still something between 0 and 1. It's not, 100, it's not that a data point that, that gets gated. What did we say? We said that that is good for points on the right. That doesn't mean that points on the right are not subject to some weight from phi 1. Is that clear? Phi 1 is still, phi 0, phi 1, phi, it, it's still having some effect on all the points in this whole space. It's just that much more of the much more of the effect, much more of the activation there is due to phi zero compared to phi one. All right. But the gating function, which is just this this split more or less into two, you could do it once at the top, and then with once you've done it once, you could keep doing it again. And again, so our gating function will have 
new and new parameters the deeper we go in this kind of tree. But it means that we could start focusing more and more on the problem cases, the data that still hasn't been split very well. This will be very useful when we uh, get to the classification trees in just a moment. Um, first, a few words about multi-class classification. So we were using a Bernoulli distribution. Bernoulli distribution, we had two classes. If you wanted to uh, take your code for two-class classification and you wanted to um, deal with situations where you have to classify things into uh, 20 bins, right? 20 different types of fish that we're going to see in our underwater footage and you need to, to distinguish them all from each other. You could use one versus all. In other words, you would go to the first fish, right? Salmon, you would say, all right, so there are two types of fish in the world. There are salmon and not salmon. And you train a classifier just to discriminate salmon. And then you would uh, go over here and say, all right, um, hammerhead shark. There are two types of fish in the world, hammerhead shark and not hammerhead shark. And you train a separate classifier for that. And this is perfectly legitimate. Lots of people do it. It's a very normal way to, to do it. How would you then decide when I hand you a new picture of a fish, which one it is of the 20? Whichever has the highest probability. Whichever has the highest probability. The beauty of what we've been doing all the time is we not only find that the point lands on one side or the other of the, of the decision boundary, but we also say, ah, actually, I know that what the probability of it is. So I might say, ah, it's more likely to be a hammerhead than not a hammerhead, but I'm only going to give that a probability of 0.55, right? Whereas maybe on the salmon side, I would say, well, that's the salmon, and it's, I'm 90% confident. Uh, so that's that would be sort of the winner out of that one versus that combination of 20 one versus all classifications. Multi-class logistic regression uh, is a way of doing what we've been doing with two classes, but you're doing it for uh, n classes. So we would say instead of a Bernoulli distribution, we're going to use a categorical distribution. So we have this lambda. The parameters, lambda, right, we're going to have n of them. They have to add up to 1. There are these, this, this behavior that we need on categorical distributions. So our formula for it is that lambda sub n is this softmax function. Uh, we're going to, to employ softmax because for all the different activations, right, we put in the activation, exponential of the activation divided by the sum of all of them and we get basically this, this fractional ratio. That way you add up lambda sub 1, lambda sub 2, lambda sub n, all together the total, the total lambdas are 1. And then your activations, your nth activation, will just be phi n times x. So we're going to have as many activations as we have classes. Previously we just had one activation because we were doing the binary class. And that's sort of the big difference. When you do that and you you sort of follow through everything that we've done this week, you can you can do the, the maximum likelihood version of multi-class logistic regression. You can do the Bayesian version, you can do the sparse version, you can do the dual version, right? You can do relevance vector machine. Everything we've done, you could do it with the categorical distribution instead of the Bernoulli distribution. As long as you just use this softmax function. All right, I'm going to skip. Uh, I'll skip ahead to this, but you, you get the idea. We've got three different acti activations: phi one, two, and phi three. Right? Our softmax function turns them into this shape. Right? The categorical distribution on softmax is saying, all right, now maybe there are uh, men, women, and children. Right? For our three different classes and our probabilities are spread spread across the, the three world states this way. Right, I said I would skip ahead because I, I want to I want to say a few words about um, random random trees. Um, I want to 
I want you to take from this that our random classification so far, we said each data point goes in and it goes down through each of the nodes. The, activate, the total activation is influenced by all of our phi's. You can make a tree where instead of adding up all of the activations, you just look at the activations in a binary way. So a data point that <coughs> enters at the root of the tree, actually it only listens to the gate function in a, very, in a binary way. The gate function says you go left or you go right. And so with, with the heavy side function as our gating function, you can end up Uh, you will end up splitting your data. So whatever goes in here, it goes to one side if it's greater than some threshold of activation. And if it goes to one side here, you will have another gating function, which might be checking some other part of the x vector, and it will push that maybe right, maybe left, so maybe it goes to the right this time. And so when you go all the way down to the leaf node, let's say, then you don't have to look at the activations of that same data point of what would have happened in the other branches. You only have to look at the nodes that were visited on the way down. So. You can think of this as a decision tree, right? It's really making these hard decisions each time. Sort of irreversible um, and a, a little bit more unforgiving. But the result is that now you have a decision tree. I want to flag decision forest. So this is in particular a technique that, that I use a lot in my group. Um, our students have published a number of papers using them. And they are also behind the, this example that I'll show in the last five minutes, um, how the Connect is doing pose estimation. So, sorry, I'm just gonna. Hey, can I get you guys to be a little quiet? All right, thanks. The random forest is a collection of trees. It's doing the same thing that we just saw with a single tree making binary decisions, but each tree is going to be slightly different from the other. The idea is that when our gating function is being optimized, we chose its parameters based on some subset of the training data. <coughs> In other words, we have this much training data. So far we've always said, if I have I training examples, I'm going to use I training examples. Right? But you can say, oh, actually I'm going to take 60% of my training examples and train my first tree. I'm going to take another different random sampling of 60% of my training examples and train my second tree. So each tree will be slightly different from the others, but then you can average together the posterior probability coming from each tree as your final posterior probability. And this, this is a very nice way of having an ensemble of classifiers, each one maybe slightly even possibly overfitting, but the, on average, they, they average out. So, the forest is, I think, one of the best Bayesian approaches to doing classification. It can do binary, it can do multi-class classification. You can also do it for regression, because it's the same structure, right? Logistic regression or regression, it can, it's doing the same thing. And it is very fast to, to train and even faster to execute. Because whenever you introduce some data at the top, if you actually split it, then for every subsequent node, you're dealing with learning about the parameter space in a, over a smaller subset of the training data. Is there a question? Yeah, OK. So. Non-probabilistic classifiers, they are great. Um, 
I wanted to talk about probabilistic classifiers. So uh, probabilistic classifiers are great because there are no serious disadvantages. If you can optimize, you are pretty sure that you have a, a decent answer. Uh, they naturally give you some no notion of uncertainty, so you can compare your out outcomes. And they can be extended to the multi-class case pretty easily. Non-probabilistic classifiers get used a lot because people didn't always understand probability when doing machine vision, and they would use tricks and approximations. So, added boost, for example, is a version of logic boost, of logic boost, which doesn't necessarily isn't Bayesian, but it accomplishes a very similar task with some pretty big approximations. Support vector machines don't give you a probabilistic output, but they are similar to relevance vector classification. Um, and you can try to squeeze something that approximates the probability out. Uh, they're not easily extended to multi-class, so people use SVMs, they do one versus many, uh, and it's sort of, sort of not pretty, but it can be done. So given the choice, I prefer relevance vector machines instead of support vector machines. Um, but uh, support vector machines, there's code floating around, so people tend to keep, keep using them. Outer boost, I think I've already discussed. Multilayer perceptron. Multilayer perceptron is basically uh, nonlinear logistic regression, where you just have a bunch of nodes. Each one has some phi, right? And uh, your sigmoid functions are what you're back propagating if you've done neural networks. All right, these techniques are not one-to-one -one comparable. So I'm not going to say that one is equivalent to the other, right? One of the probabilistic ones is equivalent to equivalent to one of these. They accomplish very similar tasks. All right, so I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to tell you about face detection, what's running in your cameras, and then I'm going to tell you about the connect. And I'm sorry I'm running a little late, but I think it's worth it. All right, face detection. Incremental learning of our phi's, where we're just going to truncate at training time. We're going to say, all right, I trained phi 0, and I trained phi, trained phi 1. Okay, now I'm ready to add the second stage. Uh, I'm going to train some parameters for phi 2, but you don't bother using all of the data into the training set. You only use the ones that were misclassified by the first two stages. Okay, not, not a terrible thing to do. Um, and you get away with it when you're trying to figure out what your split is, what your what your parameters for the heavy side function are going to are going to be, and we said well you can't differentiate, so you have to make this exhaustive list of which ways to split. Remember, I was using this. I was saying, okay, you can put your decision boundary here, here, and here. Well, uh, once you you can do fewer of those tests at the beginning, and then when you say, oh, okay, these are sort of uh, good ones, then you might refine the search and, and search more carefully in those areas. The reason people are showing you this is our feature vector, our way of analyzing the pixels. So here we're saying, you know what, we're not just going to vectorize, we're not just going to take all of these pixels and put them into a long feature vector and call that x. Instead, we're going to say, ah, my space of functions, my space of alphas that I can apply, it's going to be the response to running this kernel across the entire image. So I'm just going to run this thing that's going to add up all of the areas that are white, right, and subtract the ones that are black, and it's going to do that at every location and spit out an output, and there, and it spit out an output, and there, and there, and there. So the more of these filters that you apply, the more dimensions your X has. There's, a, there's some computational advantages to implementing them. They can be done using integral images. Uh, but the result is that you get basically 99% classification on, 99% uh, detection of faces on most images. This is also running multi-scale. You know logic boost, you could implement this. The only thing that I haven't really gone into is how how these are 
these kernels are applied quickly. If you're taking image processing, you know how convolution is done. Well, this is even faster because there's a, there's a shortcut involving integral images. And maybe we'll come back to it. This is chapter 13. Um, I will skip these other examples, and I will tell you about this one. So um, Jamie Shotton is a friend, and he's, uh, he's working on a book on random forest specifically. This is how Connect is doing pose estimation. It's saying, for every pixel in a depth image, I'm going to categorize it as being one of 31 classes. 31 classes corresponding to different parts of the body. It looks at the depth pixels, and it says, all right, for a given location, oh, it's all too high for me to point to. It says, for a given location, I'm going to compare the depth here and the depth at some offset vector. So let's say here and north by 30 pixels. I'm just going to compare them. The answer might be positive or negative. That's fine. I'll use my gating function to look at that difference. The gating function will apply some threshold to that difference. And some of the data will go left, some of the data will go right. And it keeps doing that throughout the tree. That way, all of the depth data points that end up in the same leaf node, hopefully, all have the same class label. Because we're optimizing our gating functions in order to make that happen. So we're trying to channel all the points that belong to the right hand so that they all land together. That's it. They do that, they, fit, they, they build in total three trees. The only tricky part is where do you get your training data? Well, they play a bunch of mocap back through a synthetic, through a CG character and pretend to render it in 3D. That's it. That way you get classification, which works only about 59% accuracy on the classification into 31 classes. Not great. 59%. But now remember, what we're doing is we're saying, you know, that point is which of the 31 classes. And there's a probability distribution for each of the classes. So it's not just that we are we have to get it right. We could be that maybe our second or third choice is actually right. And that's okay because there's a final step which says, okay, look at all of the parameters joint out of all of your outputs jointly and tell me what is the pose of the character. And looking at our parameters jointly is what we will do right after reading. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, till the end.